Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. What are you good at doing? I mean, really good. Did math come easy for you? What about sports? Do you enjoy adding up the numbers while someone else is out there doing the sales, maybe cooking or comforting those who are hurting or motivating the discouraged? Perhaps you are a teacher. What are your unique gifts and talents? If you were ever in a church of any kind, you probably heard that God gifts people, everyone, not all the same. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as teachers, sound familiar? And the list goes on. A creative God creates creative people, imagio Dei, in the image of God, and all of us get to enjoy the creations of both. Unfortunately, some of us struggle to figuring out what are our gifts and talents, a part of this unfortunate situation may also include an unhealthy envy of those who have the more obvious gifts, forgetting something really important. Do you know why the God of the universe gives his creatures gifts? What is the purpose of this diversity, beauty, and skill display? There's an answer, and if it's not on the top of your head, it may be why you're struggling with knowing your own giftedness. So here comes the answer. Why do you have unique gifts? Ephesians 4, 12 and 13, to equip the saints for the works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. That's a mouthful, but it's powerful. Let me put it another way. Your giftedness is to help other people break down divisions, and reveal the true God. That's the job of the church. Think we could use that today? This show is titled Creatively Faith. We're going to meet an artist who pushes creativity to a new level. She is fun. She is powerful. She's full of faith, and her story cannot but help to inspire. So welcome Hope Harrison to Church Hurts and. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Hope, you are a painter, but if I tried to tell someone the type of painter you are, I would struggle, and this is a radio show, so I can't pull out a picture, but we're going we're gonna to also put it up on YouTube, but um, give me the elevator speech. What type of painting, what type of art do you do? Well, I specialize in large-scale contemporary wall art, and Technically, it's non-objective. There's uh, at times structure happens within the piece, but uh, I don't use any tools. And uh, it's it's really fascinating at times when um, uh, I say I do seventy percent of the work and God does the rest. And and when uh, um, angels appear in them and flames appear in them that were not my uh, by my hand, it's really fascinating to see. Now, you grew up in a conservative Christian home, and, and they valued music. So oh, yeah. I want to go back for a minute and tell me about your young music career, uh, um, that creativity start. Yes, home. I followed my mom's footsteps in uh, playing the harp, starting when I was six years old, and then um, migrated to the piano when I was 15. And uh, I'm self-taught, and I don't read music, but had a, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful part of my life. Um, played with the symphony in Miami. 
uh, with playing the harp. And then um, Wade, how old were you when you played with the Symphony of Miami? I was 12. 12. Yes, 12 years old. And you didn't read music. I like no, this. I faked it the whole way. And yeah. how to, and and your father um kind of kind of threw a little bit of a tantrum when you said you weren't gonna play the harp anymore. What did he do? <laughs> well, he when I got into high school, really I uh got more interested in in uh, sports and socializing, and so I kind of let let uh my music slide and the harp, I was not focusing on it at the time. And so my dad said, well, it's a really expensive instrument you have sitting there. So if you're not going to play it, then I'm going to go ahead and sell it. So he did, he sold it. And, and I'll never forget that day seeing the harp roll out, out the door. And um, it really broke my heart. And I knew that I had somewhat made a mistake, but it really, uh, it, I would say it was a blessing in disguise because piano is really where my heart, where, my heart grew and uh, I just fell in love with the keyboard and it's been a, a, a tremendous blessing my whole life since. So you, you're also a self-taught pianist and you drove your family nuts when you <laughs> did that conversion. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I drove my family nuts for a long time figuring it out, but at this point um, I, I know they appreciate it. <laughs> Now, you know, we didn't really talk about me saying anything about this, but mm -hmm. for our listeners, I, I remember meeting Hope. She doesn't remember me, but I remember because she was seven years old playing in the middle of a living room and mm -hmm. everybody was just saying, oh, you know, the Harrisons are in town. Oh, there's Hope. And it was just <laughs> kind of like that was filled with meaning. Like, I don't know if it was trouble, but they always had a smile on their face when they said it. Aww. And so <clears throat> Thank um, you. If I could, from your conservative Christian home, you you developed expectations that you would marry young, you'd have <laughs> this great husband who would be a provider and have children and probably have a home in Kibiskain or Orlando or somewhere on the coast or something in Florida, and that's not quite what ha what happened in the time when yeah. college was in. Yeah, well, I, I certainly thought my life was going to look just like my parents, you know, married in my early 20s, couple kids and and be a stay at home mom and and focus on on my family. But uh, yeah, it 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 didn't happen that way. Uh, when I went, I went to college and I was not prepared for college. I can admit that 100 <laughs> percent. I was I was uh, um, I, I did my best to I wanted to graduate, but when I. I realized that I was wasting my time and money <laughs> and my family's money. I went ahead and uh, dove into the workforce. And, um, you know, just as far as not, not uh, being married, that, that, that relationship just hasn't happened yet. But I learned to appreciate life um, you know, and just appreciate where I was and uh, without children, you know, it's, I think, you know, you can, you can choose to, to focus on what you don't have, or you can choose to make the most of where you are. And that's what I've tried to do. So during this time, and you, you were, I mean, you were working on it and it's not like you weren't, and you got plenty of attention from men, but you ended up pouring yourself into the business world and were really successful in, in the mortgage business. I was, I was, yes. I'm a relationship person and um, and, uh, it was a great fit for me in sales and the mortgage industry. And, uh, for 13 years, I had a real solid career until everything crashed in 08. And then, then it was a real challenge, um, trying to try, trying to balance. I owned three homes when everything crashed and it was, uh, my, my income took a 90% hit overnight and it never came back. So that was tough. Yeah, I should mention to our listeners, just by a side road, uh, there was a woman who was actually working for the company that wasn't too big to fail. That was that signature moment when that crash happened in 2008. And she was actually there, one of the ones who was fired. And um, so go back and check out that show. And Church Hurts and if you're listening on podcast, 
um, I think it's called White, English, and Privileged with Julia Nand. Um, and also mention, if you're listening uh, to this by way of podcast or on YouTube um, or any of the other mediums, if you would just hit subscribe and share this with a friend, because we're about to get into a part of a story that really is kind of scary, but at the same time, there's a neat ending. So tell me about Gabriel. Well, what happened when Gabriel came along? Who's Gabriel? Gabriel is my precious son. And um, Gabriel was a surprise. I got pregnant out of wedlock. And um, uh, it was um, most certainly, especially growing up in the Christian home and, and conservative, very conservative, uh, it's not a position I ever would have thought that I would have been in, but, um, but, uh, God allowed it to happen. And Gabriel has been a, a tremendous blessing. Um, I did my best to make it work with Gabriel's father, but it, uh, um, was a very challenging situation. And I've been uh, married Gabriel's dad when Gabriel was two months old and I was only with him until Gabriel was 10 months old. So it was a short run, but uh, Gabriel was, is worth all of the challenges there. And um, he's a wonderful, wonderful young man. And um, I, uh, it was my heart to be home with him uh, and not have him in daycare. So being single since he was 10 months old, I chose to um, spend my retirement to be home with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was uncomfortable with that at first, but um, when I, that, the only way that I could look at it is I was investing in a, in a human being and, and trusting that God would provide more money just, down the road. Yeah, you know, let me just stop you there for a second, Hope, because, you know, you, you really are one who lives your life out loud and you wouldn't have had to address that issue of having him out of wedlock. We live in a time where nobody turns their head at that anymore. That's yeah. almost more common than getting <laughs> married and having the, I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? The way culture has changed in your lifetime yes. Yes. where, but man, that seriously, that had to be hard, hard, hard. Um, people knew you, you, you've been a person with outspoken faith for years yes. and then to say, oh, and well, oops, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of people have, you've helped a lot of people because you were out loud about it <laughs> and about how hard it is being a single mother. That's, oh, gosh, yeah. that's one of your passions, isn't it? Yeah. Oh gosh, absolutely. Listen, I, I said numerous times, I can see why uh, why moms go, go back to work because it's very hard to be with a young child all day long, especially alone. You know, I didn't have a husband coming home to relieve me at the end of the day, you know, and, and Gabriel has been amazing, wonderful child, but you know, it's regardless, you know, it's, it's a tremendous load. It's, it really is, but, but absolutely worth it. When, well, when my kids, uh, you know, and I, I was happily married, um, but had a couple of kids and I finally kind of fired my wife from being a full-time mom. I just would come <laughs> home. She would be so fried. I'd say, you got to go back to work to get a break. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, you say the husband come home to take off the load. <laughs> well, that wasn't this husband. I, I was a pastor and I had to go to work again, you know, mm -hmm. I had to have evening meetings and, but something happened in that time. So, you know, I don't, how was it that you ended up grabbing a couple of paintbrushes? Tell me so, about that. Yeah. So Gabriel, I was always very intentional with my time with him and I've, I've never been crafty and never painted before, but I started doing little arts and crafts with him and, uh, Gabriel, uh, part of his, um, heritage is native American Indian through his father. And I have always been fond of the native American Indian and, um, I just decided one day that in just in honor of his heritage, I was going to do one of those pieces of art that are words and phrases in different fonts. And I was going to do it in the American Indian theme and just in honor of my son and put it in the living room, just, just, just a fun little project. Well, I go get the canvas and get the paint and buy the brushes and I get home and um, paint the canvas black. And I was about to start painting I, I have a beautiful Indian oil in my living room and I was going to 
pain. Every word that I think of when I when I see that beautiful warrior on his horse and and uh, every word that comes to mind. Well, then I realize I can't paint all these different fonts and, and I didn't want to go back and buy uh, the stencil. So I just dipped one brush in red and one in gold and I painted the first word that came to mind in a script and it was brave. And then I just painted on the bottom. I just went ahead and just painted Gabriel's, the first Bible verse I ever taught him, which is Joshua 1.9. And it looked like a kindergartner could have done it, but it sparked something in me. And uh, since I don't draw or, and had never painted, I just thought, well, that was fun. I want to try something else. So I just watched one YouTube video on how to start an abstract. Piece. Okay, wait, wait, before you get into that, mm -hmm. I think some of our listeners are thinking like I did. They're kind of picturing what you just said. Here's someone doesn't know how to paint, never done it before, and stuck one brush in red and one brush in gold. That's just not the way most people are going <laughs> to You know, really, I get out two brushes, one's bright red, yeah. one's gold. Man, that is so you. I mean, it is, so me. <laughs> <laughs> it is so me. Yes, it is. Okay, it but is. that's, but it, but then, then you watch one so video watch one on video. abstract painting. Start it, how to start yeah. an abstract piece. Yes. And, and somehow we got to get to, um, people should know if you want one of hope's pieces of work, you better be rich. I mean, you got a $3,000 <laughs> is the minimum. They go up to infinity and they're just, I mean, you're here because I saw your stuff on Facebook and just said, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I mean, I mean, you're, I'm seriously picky and <laughs> You are seriously good, but Thank you. but tell me, how do you get from there to just describe describe what you're painting? What do you do? Let's just go to a hanger. Let's go to the hanger. Okay, tell us about painting in a hanger. Ah, oh, the airplane hanger. Well, um, uh, let's see. Two years after I started experimenting, um, I. It, three years later became my full-time career uh, just through people al aligning me, appreciating my work. That's one thing I'm good at is, is following through with alignments. And, and when, one thing I like to say anymore is when people tell you you have talent, believe them, you know, because I, I used to think there's, there's no way. I mean, you know, I'm just doing this for fun. And, but, uh, but the airplane hangar, let's see, two, two years into my career after, um, after three, three years after starting a gallery brought me on and that, what really catapulted my career forward but um two years later i got a, a a client approached me to um do pieces for his living room and it was ten, uh, six ten foot pieces because i knew when i when i was gonna dive into this i knew i was gonna have to set myself apart somehow and um uh the way i've done that is scale because my pieces are typically huge scale and the amount of product that i use but uh so six 10 foot pieces here I am two years into my career I've only done a few commission jobs and here I have this twenty thousand dollar commission job two years in I'm thinking uh, like heck yeah this is amazing but what the heck no way there's no way I can do this right but I I still just that's one of the reasons I've made it is because I've continued to press through some significant fear significant I mean that project was 90 gallons of paint it was huge to, again uh, borrow an airplane hanger to do it and I got to when I started that project and I can't start and stop the pieces it, it it's it's not a process it's all in one and um, it's all or nothing and so here I had 90 gallons of product to work with six 10 foot pieces and I was about to have a heart attack like a nervous breakdown I, I had texted all my prayer warriors I need you I need you now I didn't it was a it was a, a night I will never ever forget but I made it. I made it through. You know, recently somebody did a two minute video mm -hmm. of you doing a painting. Obviously it was well edited, but I I've watched it. I bet you 10 times. I oh, mean, it is you. just amazing. Um, and for our listeners, just imagine, uh, someone who's picking up full gallons of paint <laughs> and instead of a paintbrush, they're dumping paint on a canvas and then you look at it and it just makes me laugh again about you because these are big, heavy, you know, they canvas. Are. These are, these are built are. two by fours. They're not little flimsy canvases. Yeah. And I looked and I said, okay, 
So when were you a bodybuilder? You're not <laughs> struggling picking up these canvases. And you said, oh, well, my dad took me to weight lift when I was 13. Yeah, you went somewhere with that too, didn't you? Well, I mean, I never competed, but I went pretty far with it. I was uh, well into my, from 13, well into my twenties, I was, I was pumping some serious iron, <laughs> which has really uh, served a great purpose now. Cause I'm, I'm pretty strong. Cal. <laughs> so, so these, these pieces, these pieces are heavy and they're not on canvas. They're all on wood. So they're even, you know, heavier. It's because of the amount of product that I use. Canvas would never hold it. All right. So people say, yeah, they know me at Home Depot making a joke of <laughs> meaning the doing home improvement products, but they know you at Home Depot. Oh, they know me at Home Depot. Absolutely. I mean, every time I'm, I, I, I go, I, I'm leaving with 20 to 30 gallons of paint and I take my, my huge Mastiff with me. So, <laughs> so we're, we're kind of famous there. So connect this hope. Um, there's a real direct connection between your expression of yourself as an artist and, and just in a sense, the thankfulness you feel that you discovered this really later in life. You, you, you didn't start there. Um, but you're, you're outspoken in your faith. Um, um, tell, tell me about that. Cause a lot of people, they wouldn't be so much, but you are, it's very important to you that people know where you get your inspiration from. Well, first of all, it's, it's who I am to the core. Uh, I mean, I, I told my mom at three years old, I wanted Jesus in my heart. And um, uh, so, but I honestly believe that uh, when we are given gifts, um, just gifts or not, that our, our lives are to honor God and to give him the glory. So um, I feel like I uh, it's, it's my responsibility to be bold in my faith, you know, and I want to encourage people not only in that, but to discover their gifts and talents, because the God of we are created in the image of the God of the universe, and the ultimate creator. So I know, so therefore, we all have something, we all have something, people tell me all the time, Oh, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. And my response always is, We'll get to it. I mean, what are you waiting on? It doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, I'm 40, 48 years old, no art, no art background and a full-time artist and, and thriving at it now. And it's, it's, it's my, it blows my mind, but it's such an honor and it's, and I'm so, I'm just grateful. So I got to give the, I got to give God the glory for it because I didn't come up with it. You know, I've done my part. I do my part, but you know, it's, it's, it's all him. Well, you know, you're not a bumper sticker type Christian, you think, and sometimes you write about it, write thoughtful things. Um, as I said, you're direct in terms of really helping other women who are single mothers and, mm -hmm. and thinking of creative ways to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I should also point out that um, people can find out more about you at hopeharrison.net. Mm -hmm. And what, since I kind of slandered you and said, you got to be rich to have one of your paintings. <laughs> Um, the truth of the matter is you can get a, your stuff's gone into handbags and carpets. And, and if I'm right, it's just going to keep going. You're really just starting, but tell us how'd you get into handbags and carpets? Well, I did want, um, my wheels are always, are always turning. I, and, um, I, I wanted to offer different products at lower price points that, that more, more people could afford. And they're just fun. They're just creative ways to get my art. Uh, to keep getting my out my art out there so it's uh and you know and, and the ideas are not always mine my custom rugs were and uh was not my original or, excuse me was not originally my idea I was an architect that saw my work and said hey your work would make amazing custom rugs well again uh little miss I fall through with alignments and things so I was at a design show and saw a local uh custom rug company and I said hey by the way I'm an artist love to try to collaborate and off we went. So yeah, it's, it's things like that have been, have been really rewarding. We're going to have to leave in a minute, Hope, but I don't, I don't want to do it and skip over the fact that 
One of the hard things that you had to go through in life is you had an amazing mom. Mm. Tell me, oh, tell gosh. me about when you lost her and what that was like, but what an amazing woman she was, huh? Listen, if, if there is such a thing as an earth angel, which I believe there are, she is absolutely one. She uh, was the most selfless woman that I've human being that I've ever met in my life. Um, and just a servant heart to the core. And uh, she, she was present and uh, loving and to the, not only us, but to the community, to all of our friends growing up, everybody knew Mrs. Harrison. Um, and uh, she was, so precious so precious and uh I'm, I'm so grateful for her influence if i'm if i'm half as sweet as she is people in my life will, will be all right because she's <laughs> she was just her heart was just precious absolutely you lost her when you were how old uh let's see 45 oh. 45 Good. yeah she my mom my mom was uh she was she was dealt, um, I don't want to say a tough hand. She, she really, um, God gave her a lot to, to, um, to, to deal with. And I shouldn't say it like that. I apologize. It, you know, I don't, I don't believe God wants bad things to happen to people, but she suffered for a long time medically. She dealt with diabetes, a brain tumor, um, leukemia, dementia, but through all of those things, she was so strong and she was literally on hospice for two years when they thought she was going to be there for four months. And so it was, just, it was a long decline, but, um, even so she never stopped smiling, never, never stopped through the whole thing. She had the sweetest expression on her face, even through her passing. So, well, hope I want to thank you and just say a few words before we close. Years ago, someone once told me that the church loves reaping the rewards of artists, but struggles with the artists themselves. One need not be an art historian to be aware of the excesses of geniuses such as Michelangelo and the like. Neither does one have to live in an artist commune to have experienced the eccentricities of many artists in the modern day. The whole subject is just not given to starch and button downs, time clocks and rules of order. But wow, we don't want to live without their work, do we? If I was to ask you what your life needed today to get closer to your ideals, I am willing to bet most of you would easily give me a list which would include most things like more order, more planning, more cleanup, more discipline, better scheduling, better routines, better prayers, and better sleep. And you might be right. But then the artist comes along to lift your eyes to another dimension, ask your mind to think outside of the box, inspire your spirit to get into nature, turn your prayers into songs, your focus into vision, and everything gets wonderfully messed up. I don't know how to technically define the difference between creativity and art, so I'm sure I get it wrong, but that's okay. I have great confidence there are a lot of people out there who have art that isn't recognized as art or even recognized as the creative product for which it is. I've seen leaders put people together in amazing combinations which produced ridiculous results. It was art. I've seen electricians playing with wires, going to lights in places that lights aren't supposed to go, and it was art. I've seen churches disintegrate, fight, and gossip. It wasn't art. It was ugly. Any decent definition of a theistic God begins with the creative. In the beginning, God did what? Created. Created this and that and that and this, and then what? us. In his image, he created us. Male and female, he created us as what? Creative beings in the image of a creative God. How can it get much better than that? So maybe today, instead of just getting yourself together a bit more, instead of making more lists and checking them twice, 
consider creating. For what? Let's take a hint from 1 Corinthians 10. For whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Creatively faith. Creatively hope, too. It's worth a thought for church hurts and this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today, won't you? Thank you. It was worth a thought for sure and brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is the Shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end. Enjoy God today, won't you?